In this video, we're going to look at work in two and three dimensions. When we were in one dimension, this was the most general form of work that we had. The integral over time of the force multiplied by the velocity. And we said as long as we kept our forces and velocity in our one-dimensional vector notation, the math worked out. But we should still be very worried that we were multiplying two vectors when we were told we weren't really supposed to be able to multiply vectors, and it resulted in a scalar. Well, now that we're in two dimensions and three, we can do this correctly. So we define the work, in fact, as a time integral, but now we have the dot product of these two vectors. And now that works because we know the dot product gives us a scalar quantity which can be integrated to give us the work, which is also a scalar. Here I have a force as a function of time, 4t in the x direction, 2 in the y. The velocity has 8t in the x direction minus 4 in the y. I can calculate that dot product, which gives us the product of the x components, which is 32t squared, the product of the y components, which is negative 8. This is now a scalar quantity that we can now integrate let's say from t is equal to 0 to t is equal to 1 half. Now I have that integral, which is just a simple polynomial. The antiderivatives to that, 32t cubed over 3 minus 8t evaluated between 0 and 1 half, gives me 4 thirds. t cubed of 1 half should be 1 eighth, minus 4 is equal to negative 8, 3 joules. Typically, this isn't the sort of thing you can have, but we can see how this might work. Looking at work in this form, however, can give us a really important insight, which is that the work is equal to zero if the force is ever perpendicular to the velocity. And that comes from this definition of the dot product. We know the dot product of any two vectors that are perpendicular is equal to zero. And you might think, well, that maybe that's a very special case, but we ran into that special case all of the time. For example, if I have something sliding around the, along the ground, both the normal force and, in this case, the force due to gravity are both perpendicular to the velocity, and so the work done by both of those forces is equal to zero. On an incline, the velocity is no longer perpendicular to the force due to gravity, but it's still perpendicular to the normal force of the surface on the object, so the dot product between those two vectors is zero, and so the work done by the normal force on an object sliding on a surface is always going to be zero. Another example is if I have something swinging on a rope, the tension points along the rope away from the object, but the object is moving at a velocity at that instant that's perpendicular to that tension, so the work done by the tension is also zero. So identifying when forces are perpendicular to the velocity can be very handy in simplifying your calculation when finding work. Before we leave this, let's also look at the special case of constant force, because that gives us a much easier relationship to work with. If my force now is constant, it's not a function of time. I am able to take that outside of the integral. And now, if I look at just this green integral, what is the time integral of the velocity between two specific points in time? That is, in fact, the definition of the displacement. So that gives me, for a constant force, the work is simply the dot product between that constant force vector and the displacement vector. Let's do a quick example. Alice pushes a 100 kilogram crate across the ground. We'll say the ground is frictionless with a force of 24 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees below the horizontal. What is the total work on the crate after it goes six meters? That means we have to find the work of all of the forces. So here's a picture of Alice pushing the crate. Since it's along the ground, I know that the velocity has to be horizontal to the ground. If I draw a free body diagram, I have a normal force of the ground on the crate, the force due to gravity of the earth on the crate, and this pushing force, which is 30 degrees below the horizontal. Since I know it's going along the ground, 
my displacement vector will also be parallel to the horizontal surface. That tells me that the dot product between the normal force and the displacement vector is zero. The dot product between the force of gravity and the displacement vector is equal to zero. And now the dot product between the pushing force and the displacement vector is going to be the magnitude of the pushing force times the magnitude of the displacement vector times cosine theta, where here theta is the angle between the vectors tail to tail. So I do have to be careful about that. If I just translate my displacement vector down to put it tail to tail with my pushing force vector, I see that that angle theta is exactly the angle between the vectors tail to tail, which is convenient. So I can calculate my work by putting in those numbers, the magnitude of the pushing force, 24, magnitude of the displacement, 6, and cosine of 30 degrees is the square root of 3 over 2. Calculating that, I get the total work, 72 times the square root of 3 joules. The work on an object is given by this expression, which is called a path integral. To really take advantage of that, we need to know more vector calculus, and we'll look at that in some later videos. But at the moment, what's most important to us is the identification that it's zero when the force is perpendicular to the velocity, and we can derive a very simple form for the work when the force is constant.